Welcome to Navigating the Truth. It is March 5th, 2023. And this week my guest is Robert Wagner. And Robert Wagner is an expert in lucid dreaming. Enjoy the show. We interrupt to bring you this. We've hijacked your daily dose of regurgitated news to bring you Navigating the Truth. Brace yourself, listeners, as you're about to enter a world where the narrative is no longer masqueraded as the truth. A world where the conspiracies of yesterday's translate into the truths of today. Are you listening? The veils covering the truth are lifting and understandings once suppressed are finally being revealed. Will you be ready? And now, your host and navigator through these circles of lies, the host of Navigating the Truth, Caroline Bell Tumblety. Hello, welcome to Navigating the Truth. I am your host, Caroline Bell Tumblety, and today is Sunday, March 5th, and we are just rolling right through the year here, and I want to thank all the listeners out there who have designed decided to join us today. Thank you very much for listening in. And my website is soulIam.org. You can also email me and it is caroline at soulIam.com. And there is a donation button on the website if you enjoy what you're listening to there are many many great shows on KCOR. We are very fortunate. Hit that donation button. And on with the show. So today I have a really, really special guest. I'm so excited about this. I have read his books and I have really, really found him inspirational. His name is Robert Wagner and he wrote the acclaimed book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self, now in its 10th printing. And he co-authored Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple with Caroline McCready. Both books are in Audible, Kindle and CD MP3. His books have been translated into French, German, Chinese, Korean, Czech, Finnish and other language languages. A past president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, IASD, Robert serves as co-editor of the online magazine, The Lucid Dreaming Experience, which I highly recommend. I think it's a quarterly magazine, and you can also share your dreams on there. There's quite, there's a lot of information on this magazine. It's it's really worth, like, the subscription. Just sign up for it. Uh, let's see. A lucid dreamer since 1975. He has logged more than a thousand dreams lucid dreams. Robert frequently speaks of on the science and practice of lucid dreaming at international dream conferences, workshops and college classrooms. And I have the pleasure of welcoming Robert Wagner. Welcome Robert, welcome to the show. Oh thanks Caroline, it's great to be here. So I'm going to just jump right in there. How did you how did you get involved with lucid dreaming? So if you can imagine this, uh, back in 1975, I was a junior in high school, and I was reading a book by Carlos Castaneda called yep. Journey, Journey to Ixtlan. And so in this book, his shamanic teacher, Don Juan, tells him to find his hands in the dream state and become aware of dreaming. And and I I was reading this and thought, what? You, you can become aware within a dream? <laughs> and, and so there wasn't really a practice. So I just uh, created a practice. And within three nights, I had my first lucid dream. Wow. You know, I had a similar experience. Um, it was Don Juan, the Carlos Castaneda book. And that's exactly how I had my first dream. I tripped over a fence. And when I tripped over the fence in the dream, I looked at my hands. And I became ah. conscious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so, so that introduced me to lucid dreaming, and I was amazed. I, I just had a really powerful first lucid dream, and, and so then I was just hooked, hooked on the practice. So, like, what, like, you also go into the Tibetan, right? Um, the dream yoga. Is it the dream yoga? Right. So. 
So one of the beautiful things about lucid dreaming is that it's been scientifically validated uh, since 1980, but mm -hmm. for the thousands of years prior to that, for 2,000 years, it's been part of Buddhist dream yoga practice. So mm -hmm. they use lucid dreaming and they connect it with Buddhist philosophy, and they, they have a very deep practice called Buddhist dream yoga. For a thousand years, it's been practiced in Sufism and in, in mystical Islam. It, it's also been part of native shamanic traditions all around the world for many thousands of years. So it's kind of neat that this was a spiritual practice that people didn't really understand. But then the scientific evidence came out and people go, oh, this is really a legitimate thing. And so mm -hmm. it, it has incredibly deep roots. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So it is. I also am um, subscribed to the magazine, and I always find that like um, full of things that I wouldn't even think of. You know, like what to do when you find yourself actually awake and aware in a dream. So to go back to like um, you go into it in nineteen seventy five, and did you study at all with any anybody who was um, teaching? The art of dreaming? Not really. Um, that was kind of the beautiful part of it. Um, mm -hmm. I let lucid dreaming teach me. So yeah. so I just learned by doing. I, I began this practice of looking at my hands before I'd go to sleep and telling myself tonight in my dreams I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. And, and then in the middle of the night, my dream in a dream, my hands might pop right in front of my face and I go, oh my God, I'm dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, what I, I just began to learn by doing, by being consciously aware, seeing what worked, what didn't work. And and uh, and I just kept going deeper and deeper. I knew a little bit from reading the Castaneda books uh, of what Don Juan said, um, you know, things to be on the lookout for. But it mm -hmm. was really I, I was kind of a self-taught lucid dreamer. And I let lucid dreaming teach me how to be a better lucid dreamer. That's wonderful. So it's your, all your own experience here, which is really, really, really wonderful. The, the, um, for the listeners who are not really familiar with the term lucid dreaming, could you go into a little more detail about um, what it really actually is? Yeah, so a lucid dream is any dream in which you realize within the dream that, hey, I'm dreaming this, Th this is a dream. So, so you know within the dream, it's a dream. I, I had a spontaneous lucid dream when I was probably 10 or 11 years old, which kind of illustrates how lucid dreaming works. So um, so think, think that you're in this dream. So I'm in this dream, but I don't realize it's a dream. I, I think I'm in real reality. I'm mm -hmm. at the public library looking at books and all of a sudden, here comes a little Tyrannosaurus Rex dinosaur walking <laughs> through the book stacks. And even at age 10 or 11 there, I thought, wait a second, th this isn't right. Uh, dinosaurs are extinct. How can there be a dinosaur here in the public library? And then it occurred to me, I have to be dreaming. This is a dream. And mm -hmm. so, so once I had that thought, I realized, well, boy, if this is a dream, then I can tell myself to wake up and I'll wake up. And so I told myself to wake up and I woke up and that was my very first spontaneous lucid dream uh, as a young guy. But I never realized the potential because yeah. in most of our dreams, we just go along with whatever happens. You know, mm -hmm. each night uh, we have normally about five uh, segments of dreaming. We spend about two hours and 20 minutes in the dream state each night if, if we sleep for eight hours. And, and so all of us have lots of dreams all the time, but uh, becoming lucidly aware is when you realize, wait, there's something wrong, something's not right here, and the only explanation is this is a dream. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, like I've had a few lucid dreams in my lifetime, and what struck me about them was like um, how much realer it seemed. Like everything just became really, really vibrant. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes when we become lucidly aware, it's it's kind of amazing to 
compare the lucid dream reality to waking reality. Mm -hmm. And so in the lucid dream reality, sometimes things do seem much more vibrant. It seems more uh, light and alive. Sometimes the colors seem incredibly vivid and, mm -hmm. and all of that. But, but, it, but just that you have a vivid uh, dream isn't enough. You have to realize, wait a second, this mm -hmm. is a dream. I know I'm dreaming this. But you're right. Sometimes you do have that sense of kind of super supercharged, super energetic uh, type dream. Yeah, yeah. And like, do you connect down, um, like people describe sleep paralysis? Would you say that that's like a primer? Like, a, like I know there's a lot of fear around the, the experience of the sleep paralysis, but I, by mastering like my own fear, when that would happen, I was actually able to slip out, you know, uh, like to yeah. get myself out. Right, yeah. right. So, so um, sleep paralysis, uh, just for everyone listening, uh, th that's that occasional event where you feel like you've woken up and you're laying there in bed, but your body won't move. And um, sometimes you might feel like something's sitting on your chest or if you get into a fearful mindset, then you might think, oh, there's a burglar in my room or whatever. So, so sleep paralysis is kind of a funny state where your mind is awake, but your body's asleep. Now, one of the major uh, scientific researchers in lucid dreaming, uh, Stephen LaBerge, he said that what he thinks happens is that in normal dreams, uh, we're kind of basically functionally paralyzed. I mean, we're laying there in bed or, or we normally have rapid eye movement. We, we have this incredible dream happening inside of our head, but, but our body is basically fundamentally paralyzed. And so what he thinks is sometimes you wake up from a dream, but your body hasn't gotten the notice that, Hey, we're awake now. So, so allow yourself to move and, and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you're, but you're right. Uh, sleep paralysis can lead to regular uh, lucid dreams, if you know how. Uh, mm -hmm. For most most people, just want to get the heck out of sleep paralysis. They don't. Yeah. They don't like that feeling. They don't like sitting there, uh, immobile, uh, unable to move. Mm -hmm. And and also, you have to be careful not to get into a fearful mode because otherwise, you'll kind of hallucinate uh, fearful imagery. But yeah. But if you relax and and uh, do something like this, like in the sleep paralysis state, just imagine that you're flying over a nearby park or a nearby lake. Just keep imagining that, keep imagining that. And then oftentimes suddenly you'll find yourself flying over a nearby park or lake mm -hmm. and you'll realize, <laughs> Hey, this is a, this is a lucid dream. I've shifted from sleep paralysis into a lucid dream. But, uh, but I'll tell you in my life, uh, I've had more than a thousand lucid dreams, but mm -hmm. in terms of sleep paralysis, boy, I've maybe had sleep paralysis three or four times. So, wow, that's so, great. Not yeah. very often, not very often at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, um, like, if it has to do with maybe the level of stress that a person might be experiencing, you know, because the sleep paralysis is not something that has happened to me, like, regular. It's happened to me enough times where I remember it, you know, and... Mm -hmm. One of the times that it happened, I, I face, as I say, I faced my fear <laughs> and I found myself slipped out and I was just like walked right through the wall and realized I was dreaming. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think that's part of it, uh, kind of coming to terms with the fear of it and uh, because it is a strange feeling to to be mm -hmm. immobile. Oh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so... Uh, for me, uh, the first thing I realized that if I could convince myself to move my little finger or, or move, twitch my toe, normally mm -hmm. that would break the sleep paralysis spell and I could wake up. But, yeah. but then I read a book uh, by Ryan Hurd called Sleep Paralysis. And that's where he suggested this idea that, oh, in the sleep paralysis state, just relax. Mm -hmm. Use your imagination to imagine yourself flying over a nearby park or whatever. And if you if you focus and concentrate your energy on that, then you'll s switch over into a lucid dream and uh, find yourself flying over a nearby park. Yeah. So, like, how about um, you give us a little more insight to the to the world of lucid dreaming? Like, we be, we we encounter people, like all kinds of beings. Like, 
what is your what is your take on it all? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's it's um, first one thing I want to say about lucid dreaming is uh, it does take a little bit of practice, and and mm-hmm. so uh, so you have to realize that if you're getting on the lucid dreaming path, uh, first you want to have good dream recall. Because mm-hmm. if you're not recalling your dreams, then, then you're going to have a difficult time uh, even recalling the times you become lucidly aware. So you want to have good dream recall. And then it helps to have a practice that you do every day or every night before you go to sleep in, in order to kind of help induce a lucid dream. You know, for me in the early days, it was looking at my hands before I'd go to sleep and telling mm-hmm. myself, tonight my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. And um, what would happen, I'd be in a dream and I might be climbing a ladder and see my hand and go, wait a second, my hand, this is a dream. So, so mm-hmm. that, that's kind of the practice that I used to get started. But the beautiful thing is once you're consciously aware within the dream state, then it's like this open platform of all the things that you can do, especially if you know how to do it. And so like one thing, uh, we're all kind of social creatures. And so a lot of us like to talk to dream figures. And and one funny thing is a lot of lucid dreamers report, just like I experienced, if you go up to a dream figure and say, hey, do you know I'm dreaming you? <laughs> Oftentimes they'll say something like, how do you know I'm not dreaming you? Yeah. Or, or, or they'll look down at the ground like like you're the biggest idiot in the lucid dream uh, and all. So it's much better. I, I learned over time to ask a dream figure, who are you or, or what do you represent? Because mm-hmm. sometimes the lucid, the dream figure will tell you exactly what it represents. And th- this is really good if you might become lucid in kind of a nightmare scenario because mm. something's chasing you and you remember, oh, oh this is that recurring nightmare Oh, that means I'm dreaming right now. If you become lucidly aware at that moment, then you can turn and face the thing, knowing it's a dream figure, and say, who are you? Or what do you want? And oftentimes people are stunned by what they learned and what they hear. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then they know what, what it is that's chasing them, You know what, what they're connected to there. But with that knowledge, then you can just do remarkable things and, and go from there. So there's a lot of exploring you can do, interacting with dream figures. You can fly around like Superman. You can go through walls. You, you can explore to your heart's content. But, but after a while, you begin to realize that there's even more going on. Yeah. And, and, and so that, that's one reason I called my first book, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self, is uh, after 10 years of lucid dreaming, I realized um, uh, that you can ignore all the dream figures and ignore the dream setting and just ask a question of the dream, or, or maybe it's the unconscious mind or the inner self. You can just look up and say, hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. And then the entire lucid dream will change or, or maybe something new will appear. But but realizing that there's a response of inner awareness, I think that's really what um, sent my lucid dreaming career into overdrive. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, because it's um, not what we're being told, you know, like um, dreams are kind of passed off as like just something we do, you know, when we sleep. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, a, a number of scientists, you know, especially 30 or 40 years ago before the evidence for lucid dreaming came out, I mean, they would call dreams the junk of the mind. Mm-hmm. They would call dreams uh, the mind in psychosis. And, and and they were just so negative and derogatory about, you know, dreaming, which everybody does every night. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's, it's kind of great to have lucid dreaming come along because then you're consciously aware within the dream you can do personal experiments and you can also do scientific experiments as well. And so there's been a lot of scientific experiments that have been done uh, within when the person is consciously aware within the dream state. And so so that's the beauty of it. And then you have the whole spiritual aspect of it that that you can take enormously deep. So it's it's really a profound state of awareness. Absolutely. The, the idea that um, somebody like can actually come up with something in science, you know, like um, I, like 
I, I, my mind just starts going like um, doctors, nurses, like everybody, like going in there, like for solutions, for like for help, like scientists, um, archaeologists, even you know, like the 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 it's limitless, really, because it is for me. Some of the deepest learnings I have experienced have happened there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I tell people because sometimes people haven't had lucid dreams. And so they say, well, what's the value? And I said, well, look, when you're consciously aware within a dream, if you know how, then you can access your inner creativity. And sometimes that creativity just comes in buckets loads. You can't believe how creative your inner awareness is. Also, mm -hmm. you can use lucid dreaming for emotional healing. Already, uh, some therapists use it to help people who have recurring nightmares from PTSD. Mm -hmm. And then other lucid dreamers have used it to resolve phobias, to deal with their anxiety, to see how the mind works and take care of that and other things. Th then some lucid dreamers uh, report using lucid dreaming to heal the physical body or sometimes yeah. to get inner advice on, on how to heal. And so that's really another fascinating area. But for me, I, I think when I began to interact with this awareness behind the dream, this responsive inner awareness, that was one thing that really blew my mind. And then when I started to do some spiritual practices in lucid dream, like uh, meditate or, or do things like that, or ask to have uh, spiritual experiences, that, then when that began to happen, it was like, whoa, this is really incredibly deep. So again, mm -hmm. it's an open platform. Uh, wherever you are, you can explore it. And it's truly a phenomenal uh, state of awareness. Absolutely. And uh, like when you see the awareness that there is an awareness there inside the, the dreams, like the, what do you think that is? I mean, is that an aspect to you? Like, what do you think it is? Well, one thing that I uh, mentioned in my first book, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self, is that Carl Jung, uh, the, the famous uh, psychologist, he said that maybe all of us have a type of inner ego or inner self, and that mm -hmm. if someone could show that it had these qualities like perception and judgment and reflection and creativity, and, and he listed about a dozen things, if somebody could show that our inner awareness had that, th then we might actually have an inner self of a kind. And, and that's that's what I mentioned in the first part of my book. And I bring up a bunch of lucid dreams that mm -hmm. show that this inner awareness, sometimes it tells you, you'll ask to have an experience, and it tells you you're not ready. Yeah. Come, back, come back when you're more focused. And so mm -hmm. that means it has judgment, it has reflection, it kind of knows where you're at. So, yeah. so I think I think what we're dealing with is what I would call the the inner self. The and inner I, self. And I think everyone should be excited about that the idea of directly interacting with the inner self in a lucid absolutely, thing. absolutely. We're coming up on a break right here, and anyone wants to have a question for Robert, call in or type it in chat and we will be right back after this break. You're listening to Navigating the Truth with Caroline Bell Tumblety, where the truth survives and the lies are exposed. I just want to assure you that uh, everything is under control. There's been no damage except for some temporary malfunction of the radio. Come be a part of this awakening by joining us in chat or by calling our hotline at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers, find us on Skype at KCOR Radio. We're pushing the ultimate frontier here. Control must be maintained. More disinformation exposed and the truth discovered after a word from our sponsors. One million miles till midnight. A story of timelines, artificial worlds, simulated races, and the galactic imprint, and the destiny of a blue world called Earth. One Million Miles Till Midnight, written by Solaris Blue Raven, is a journey through the mind's eye which allows the reader to surf a wave of technological and multidimensional intellect. 
revealing a bridge between conscious design and the truth. A multi-dimensional bleed-through awakens the world of artificial intelligence to set sail into the frontiers of a vast multiverse, morphing planets and terraforming ascended worlds beyond the linear programs of a fated race. One million miles till midnight will awaken, inspire, prepare and enlighten one to the many multidimensional states of consciousness and worlds we reside in. With every cell and atom, we are this truth and multiverse. One Million Miles Till Midnight, written by Solaris Blue Raven. Available now at Amazon.com. Don't wait. Get your copy today. C.O.R. Digital Radio Network. I love the way it sounds. I love the music. I listen all day. The future of radio is here and now. The only. Alien Deceptions, a suspenseful sci-fi romance thriller by Tina Marie. Featuring the tantalizing Erica Jones and the mysterious Russell Hamilton. An out-of-this-world book of fiction based on years of document facts and files the government does not want you to know about. At least, not yet. Alien Deceptions by Tina Marie. Available now at Amazon.com or get a signed copy at TinaMarieEntertainment.com. Get your copy now. Change your frequency, change your life with the Lemurian Plug. The Lemurian Plug is easy to control, simple to set up, and wireless. It helps to neutralize toxins and has restorative frequencies for healing. It also helps to protect you and your family from EMFs. The Lemurian Plug is energy efficient and designed using ancient technology for a superior design. One unit can cover up to 1,000 square feet. This life-changing product is reasonably priced. And isn't your family's health worth a small investment? For more information on the miraculous effects of this plug or to purchase the Lemarian Plug, visit thelemarianplug.com. That's thelemarianplug.com. The Lemarian Plug is like nothing you've ever experienced. Order yours today. Vegas is number one source for talk and new music. How cool is that? Going live in three, two, one. Welcome back to Navigating the Truth, the one show that peels back the masks of the elite and exposes the truth we're not being told. Here to warn you. You must not abuse the power you've been given. Eventually, you will lose control of that power and the whole world will suffer. Come partake in the awakening by calling the show at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Give us a call now. Those around the world, connect with us on Skype at KCOR Radio. Follow us on Twitter at KCOR Radio or Use hashtag KCOR. Come engage in the discussion live in our chat room at www.kcorradio.com. Our survival depends upon it. Now, back to examining the narratives and uncovering the truth with your host of Navigating the Truth, Caroline Bell Tumblety. Caroline Bell Tumblety. Hi, welcome back to Navigating the Truth, and I am your host, Caroline Bell Tumblety, and I have a wonderful guest with us today. I have Robert Wagner, and Robert Wagner is an author, speaker, um, workshop giver. He is an expert on lucid dreaming, and welcome, Robert. <laughs> welcome oh, back. <laughs> thanks, happy to be here. And we were talking through the break, like what direction to go in and you were saying that maybe um focus on like some of the the beings that we might encounter during our lucid dreams and so I thought maybe I would share like uh, a lucid dream that I had I had this dream quite quite a while ago over maybe over 20 years ago and it what it was was my friend had passed away um, and I had the, like, I, I just, I knew that I would be able to find her. 
Like I knew I um I knew that I had the ability to do that. And I had set myself up with a whole um focusing and I found myself in a lucid dream where I was um it was like a convalescence home or a hospital. And when I got there, there was a woman who was dressed like a nurse. Something about her made me think maybe she was the nurse, but I was basically saying, I want to see my friend. And they were like, no, they were actually, she was actually um, really um, surprised to see me and told me that I shouldn't be there and that it would only upset my friend because she was in like an in-between space where she was not really aware that she was dead that um that it would only confuse her to see me so she pretty much talked me out of what I was going to do which was actually go and speak to my friend and um she said I could see her <laughs> through a window but I wasn't allowed to speak to her and it was um I could see her sitting in the garden and she was in a wheelchair and um she she already looked better than the last time that I had seen her but yeah, that was the that was the lucid dream I had. Like I was I was not a happy camper. <laughs> you know, I I, I think um, the deceased dream figures are are probably the times when we're most likely to become lucidly aware mm-hmm. because we'll, we'll we'll find ourselves in the dream. We'll we'll think it's real, but all of a sudden we see uh, Aunt Ellen. And we think, wait a second, she passed away five years yep. ago. How can mm-hmm. this be? And, mm-hmm. oh, I must be dreaming. And so so it's a wonderful opportunity to explore the nature of that dream figure. Because when I think about it, at that point, I'm not exactly sure, am I dealing with a dream figure, which is a projection of my own mind, or am I dealing with something else, uh, the, the spiritual essence of mm-hmm. someone who's who's come to visit me. And so I, I always encourage lucid dreamers, you know, you, you've got to ask some questions. And so so I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Um, uh, in my own life, um, 20 some years ago, my, my dad passed away. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I thought, you know, I'll wait a few months and try to find him in a lucid dream. And so I became lucidly aware. And I remembered that I wanted to find my father, my deceased father. And all of a sudden, all of the dream figures in that lucid dream begged me not to do it. They oh. told me they told me it wasn't time that that it wasn't wasn't time. Thank you for listening to Navigating the Truth with my guest Robert Wagner. If you would like to hear the rest of the show, please go to kcrradio.com. And thank you very much. <laughs>